So together with my co-chairs, Julia Wilson and Rose Revento, as well as our guest today, Jeffrey Barrett, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Welcome Sanger Institute's virtual seminar series and our first talk of 2021. So these lockdown seminars are an opportunity for us to share the scientific challenges that the Institute is tackling and also to give you insights into the re research and collaborative open science at the Institute. So it is our great pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Barrett to this month's uh, seminar. Jeff Barrett is the director of the Sanger Institute's COVID-19 Genomics Initiative. And prior to that, Jeff actually studied the genetic basis of human disease in both industry and academia. He was most recently chief scientific officer at Genomics PLC, and before that, director of Open Targets, a public-private initiative that's using human genetics to improve the early stages of drug discovery. In addition, Jeff has also uh, was a group leader at the Sanger Institute for 10 years, working on the genetics of inflammatory and neurodevelopmental diseases. And so we're very fortunate to have a very timely talk from Jeff today, where he's gonna speak about his work um, on the sequence and analysis of samples from COVID tests around the UK in near real time in order to help guide public health response to local outbreaks. So as usual, we're gonna have a 30 minute pre-recorded presentation by Jeff, followed by a 30 minute live question and answer. And so we ask that if you do have any questions now or as the seminar goes along, please put them in the question box and please also vote for the questions that you think you would most like for the panel to ask Jeff during the question and answer session. Welcome, Jeff. I would like to uh, welcome Jeff and you all to the Q&A session of the seminar. Uh, please ask your questions in the box on the screen and we will ask the most popular questions. So if there is one you would like uh, to see answered, please use the upvoting function. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, Jeff. And yeah, let's go with the first question. So one of the, the most popular question is if a uh, chronic infection that seems to lead to rapid evolution and increase uh, the risk of uh, deadly strains. And what are other uh, selective pressures that might drive this evolution? And they, they are also asking about vaccination, if it could be one of these uh, selective pressures. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's a, uh, an excellent question that I think is at the front of mind for lots and lots of scientists. Um, um, I don't think we know for sure. I mean, there are some, you know, good hypotheses that one can put forward. Um, so one is, yeah, that clearly if essentially, you know, when the virus arrived at the beginning of, or the end of 2019, the whole world was naive. And so um, you know, existing immunity, whether by previous infection or vaccines, you know, put no selective pressure on the virus. And that is changing in different places at different speeds. So for example, in some parts of the world, including um, uh, Laos in, in Brazil, the first wave was very bad and there are some very high estimates of the fraction of the population who were infected the first time as high as 75%. And so that could, in theory, uh, begin to select for mutations that allow partial escape from existing immunity. Uh, no one has really demonstrated that, um, but I think it's a plausible hypothesis. The both the P1, so that's the one first observed in Brazil, and B1351 variants first observed in South Africa, have a mutation E484K in the spike protein, which is has been seen in lab experiments to basically, um, you know, to a certain amount, not completely, but slightly reduce the efficacy of existing either monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies from neutralizing viruses with this 484K. So that's a kind of, that's a possible functional um, uh, mutation that could be affecting um, infection. And the fact that it's arisen twice in different parts of the world, and both those parts have heavy um, first wave uh, amounts of cases are all kind of indirect evidence that something like this might be, be, be beginning to happen. And then of course, getting to the second part of the question, you know, as we, the whole world begins vaccinating, you know, all over the place, we will start with more and more of that kind of selection on the virus. And so I think, it is likely that it will have more of you know more of these mutations that might allow partial escape from immunity uh, to spread. 
you know, people are working on this super, super fast. And it's kind of amazing at the, you know, the amount of work that's being done so fast to study this. Um, I don't think there's any evidence yet that any of these variants are fundamentally going to be able to get around vaccines. There's actually a really nice preprint that came just today from the BioNTech group showing some pretty good evidence that, that specifically the spike constellation of mutations in B117 um, is still neutralized by uh, polyclonal serum from vaccinated individuals with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So that's a really nice positive message because essentially all cases of COVID in the UK right now are to for its approximation B117. So it's very important that the vaccine works against them and early data is suggest yes. So then the last thing I'll say is just that even if this begin if this does become problematic, you know, these vaccines can be adjusted and especially the RNA vaccines, it's kind of amazing. Um, you know, it, it's not my expertise, but I've read read statements from the companies that, you know, in a matter of weeks, they could potentially begin to manufacture a vaccine with a new RNA payload that matches the current, um, you know, most predominant variant. So I think we still do have weapons in our arsenal, even if the virus begins to uh, evade some of the existing immunity. Thank you. Jeff, the next question that's got the most votes is a more logistical question. So what is the time frame from sample collection to sequencing data? And how short does that need to be to enable early intervention in an outbreak? Yeah, so this is an absolutely critical question. When I would present these data before the B117 experience, when we were looking at these local outbreaks, that would be the question all the time, which is how fast can you do it? So in the fall, our average turnaround time from the swab is up someone's nose to the data are in the kind of map of the UK was two weeks, and that's probably too slow. So we have worked very hard to try to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze that. And it's it's really, you know, it's kind of interesting as you know, it's not a scientific question at all. It's, as you said, Julie, it's it's fundamentally about logistics. And it's about the logistics of how fast we can get the um the shipments of the waste material from the Lighthouse Labs. We moved to seven day work on the Genome Campus to be able to take that gap out. Um, we have relocated the, the lab, which is doing some of the fundamental sample handling to a dedicated space with new robotics, which has again, sort of cut a matter of a, a day or so off on the kind of back end bioinformatics when you know we're spitting out 10,000 sequences a week now. Um, and there's time to kind of get those, process them, align them to the rest of the data generate these trees of how the sequences are related you know those methods don't easily scale so again we're trying to to together with all the other partners in cog uk who do a lot of that work to kind of um figure out ways to make that as efficient as possible so that we're down to about 10 days now we think we can get it down to about seven days and i think that will be um at the boundary of being genuinely useful seven days still feels like a lot but i think if you actually look at lots of data feeds you know that we rely on that the public health agencies rely on like just the number of cases for example they do lag by several days because you know for all the same kind of reasons the tests have to be physically processed reported put into systems analyzed etc so uh, we're on a good trajectory and that's a huge huge credit to john silito sonia gonsalves all of their teams uh who do truly amazing work in processing this volume of samples at this speed thank you hi jeff well, I'll continue going through the, the top rank questions. Um, so one of the questions really talks about the evolution of the Sanger Lighthouse project, let's say over the next six to 12 months. Um, you know, the, the, the landscape of infection in the community is just changing all the time, particularly in terms of, of the, um, the number of cases we have. And I guess there is a kind of expectation that the number of cases may well decline over the next six to 12 months with the wider immunity due to vaccination as well as the decreased infection with better weather in the summer and better control measures. So, so how does that shift the emphasis maybe from different types of surveillance or other activities? Uh, so, um, you know, this epidemic in the UK has it continues to change every you know, sort of week by week, month by month, and we try our best to plan, um, but often our predictions aren't quite right. Um, nonetheless, I think it is true that we can, we certainly hope that, you know, if the current restrictions are kept in place long enough, it will be case numbers down. As vaccines are deployed, that will create a buffer of immunity that will make that a long thing. And then, as you say, hopefully in spring, summer, we'll get more of the, the kind of fortunate situation we had in summer 2020 when community transmission was very low. Um, 
we had talked last summer about a strategy that we should really be aiming to sequence everything. Every community test, we should just sequence it because it gives you the ability then obviously to do surveillance because you have 100% coverage, but also any of the targeted things you want to work on, which I mentioned at the very beginning, you just, now it becomes a data lookup problem rather than a, I need to pull a sample out of a cavernous freezer with 6 million other samples. So I think what we will be doing is hoping to scale up um, our sequencing numbers even beyond the, the 10,000 a week we're at now um, and matching it as best we can to the sort of changing base level of community transmission, possibly going up to, you know, as close to everything every week as we can. Then I think in the long, I think that's going to be almost no matter what, that's, we're going to still have a role in this Sanger Lighthouse partnership for the end of this year. Um, and I think there are plans afoot to try to set up something longer term, you know, that is really more owned and run by a government agency and becomes kind of genomic surveillance for the UK in the future. And the hope is that you know, end of 21, early 22 is when we can kind of hand over uh, that kind of work. But it's, you know, it's early days in the planning of that. And um, where, you know, Sutter is certainly committed to supporting this for as long as, uh, as we needed. And can I just add to that? Is there any discussion about extending this beyond the UK's borders, especially in, in lower min middle income countries? Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. And the WHO in response to all of these new variants has actually you know, put out a call to say all countries should improve their surveillance, um, holding up the UK among others as, as exemplars. Um, we have thought about it. We might be interested. Um, the challenge is all about the logistics, right? So just that whole answer I gave of timing and, and logistics, you know, every country is going to have its own specific set of those problems. So it's very likely that, you know, you by setting up this problem, uh, sorry, this project haven't solved the exact most important problems in Germany or India or anywhere else. So I think it's, in a, it's we're totally open-minded about it, but we haven't yet seen the kind of fit where we think we can make a big difference. Thank you. Yeah, so I will also go into another logistics question and how, and the question is how are the samples uh, distributed at the, about uh, the different uh, UK uh, sequencing centers? So geographically, centers like Sanger getting uh, samples from the surrounding uh, test centers or is, or is it random distribution? Yeah, so there's two sample flows in Cov UK. So one is the one I, I spent most of my time talking about in the talk, which is from these lighthouse labs to Sanger. And those are all around the UK geographically randomly distributed. So we get a mix of things from all over the country um, with the uh, with recently the exception of uh, we get fewer samples from Wales because we don't have the regular sample trucks from the newest lighthouse lab in Wales but Public Health Wales have a connection to them so that they've kind of picked up that coverage. Um, there, whenever we have an excess of, of the surveillance pillar two samples each week that we've picked, we can actually then send them on, if we, but not enough sequencing capacity, we send them on to sequencing centers who will who do additional sequencing and a few of the sites have pretty, pretty beefy amounts of capacity as well. Uh, and then the other major flow is pillar ones, so basically tests in hospital and healthcare settings a different kind of um, set of individuals, you know, they're, they've mostly gone to the hospital or healthcare facility because they're pretty sick. So it's a different collection of patients than the ones we get through the community testing. Those are very much sort of um, partnerships of the local sequencing centers and the local hospitals, you know, so the University of Birmingham has a good relationship with the, the sequencing lab, which um, uh, Nick Lohman and others run is, you know, has a good relationship with a bunch of the local hospitals and that's how the sort of samples flow through there. So we have pretty good coverage, and I know that Cog UK works really hard to try to keep at least some coverage of the Pillar 1 samples uh, connected to the, the kind of closest Cog sequencing site. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. The next question on the list is, um, uh, what's the sensitivity of genomics to detect new viral strains as they emerge? I think so. Or, um, the question asks, what percentage of samples do you need to see it in before you can say it's a new strain? And does this vary with overall of infection rates? Yeah, so um, I mean, clearly what we'd like to do, especially for these new variants, if they have different biological properties, like being more transmissible or evading existing immunity, Want to find them as fast as possible. It's hard though because you know the the virus is mutating at some rate every day, and we sequence lots of samples, and so you don't know what's exciting until or interesting until you know you've kind of put some pieces together. 
I think we've learned, so, you know, we, we were, I think, um, pretty fast compared to if this had come up in, in other countries in terms of when we realized something unusual was happening. I think, you know, the, the internal conversations we all now are looking at, what have we learned that we could have figured this out even a few weeks earlier? Um, you know, there were, I, I forget, something on the order of, there are certainly hundreds, maybe about a thousand B117 sequences, I think, before. People had noticed it before then, but I think that's how big the data set was when the alarms were, really went off. You know, one thing we've learned, I think, is that sometimes these brief bursts of evolution, maybe in a chronic patient, that produce suddenly a, a new variant of the virus with lots of mutations, that is an unusual thing, and we should probably be, you know, ring that alarm, that initial alarm bell anytime we see that happen again, because it seems like, you know, that's one of the modes which the virus can do something that is, that is going to be concerning. Of course, it might be that the first vaccine escape mutant is some benign looking single point mutation. I mean, we just don't know, but that was a, that was a thing that I think the community learned, um, you know, this looking for these, um, you know, lots of mutations. It's also become increasingly clear um, that we can start to annotate some specific mutations using other kinds of systematic experiments that are being published to say, okay, if we see, you know, 484K plus these particular deletions in the N-terminal domain of spike or whatever, that those are things that, you know, both from what we've observed in these faster spreading variants and also these in vitro experiments, we can annotate mutations as they come on the scene. So that might mean with fewer sequences, we can say, okay, we're just beginning to see a cluster grow in this particular place, but it is carrying a payload of mutations that we know are worrisome. And so we should be really looking more carefully at it. So, you know, the kind of, it's an evolving process, uh, no pun intended, um, that as we learn kind of changes happen in the virus and which ones, and how we do it. Thanks, Jeff. You froze for a moment, but I think oh. we, we, did, we got the, yeah. we got I, I, that. I just want to follow up a little bit on that, Jeff, and then I, I have a, another question. But, but yeah, because in a way, with the new strain, you had to wait for two signals, right? So, as far as I understand, you had to identify a, a cluster and increase, but then you had to see a rise in incidence to really ascribe function to this. And, and clearly, that's not what you want to do: is to wait until there is an increased incidence in the population. So, it, it is a bit of a kind of di difficult yeah, conundrum. A, yeah, I mean, so you know one thing one positive way of looking at it is you know unfortunately it was a bit too late for the uk but we did manage to alert the rest of the world that this exists i mean this variant is everywhere now probably at some low level and the fundamental question to governments across the world is can you, you know, use restriction sensibly to essentially um you know keep this fuse as long as possible that is slowly burning of b117 growing in every country as as most as at least some countries are starting to deploy vaccines to avoid having this, you know, really big peak. I think, you know, there's some evidence is a bit sparse, but there's some evidence that, for example, the, the big peaking cases that happened in Ireland was at least partially related to the arrival of B117. They also had a sort of Christmas easing of restrictions, but a few cases had seeded, you know, because they then had mixing over the holidays. You know, I think B117 spread quite widely. By contrast, uh, Denmark is an example of you know, they have excellent levels of genomic surveillance now, in part because, as people may remember, there was this thing about a mink, uh, a mink variant last year that, that was detected in Denmark. And so they really put excellent genomic surveillance in place in response to that. And they have seen, you know, they could see in December, you know, week by week, it was like a quarter of a percent B117, half a percent, one percent, two percent, it's doubling every week. You know, and they, I think maybe for multiple reasons, but in part because of that increased the stringency of their re restrictions, and they're really pushing down their epidemic, which I think, you know, personally, I think is a, is a good approach, you know, be aware of what's happening and try to respond earlier. You know, to come back to your, your point, Matt, about what about the next variant, and we don't want anywhere to have to deal with the, the rise in cases, that kind of gets to the things that I, I forget, I don't know if it got cut off in my uh, internet connection problem, but its ability to annotate bioinformatically why some mutations, and then when we see one or two sequences in a cluster, not 100 or 200, and say, this is, you know, this is a serious problem or at least a potential problem. And I'm not sure we can perfectly predict this, or I'm sure we can't perfectly predict them. I'm not, I'm not sure yet whether we can usefully predict worrisome sequences, but I think we are getting better and better at that as we start to see more and more examples of things that do become substantial problems like B117. Yeah, great, no, that's, that's good. Um, I, I think I'll ask a question if that's still okay, because that was kind of a continuation of the last one. 
a little bit just different, Jeff. You know, we, we recognize that this is a huge challenge scientifically, logistically, involves people, scientific complexity, and, and, and you would have anticipated a lot of these challenges. But what, was there been something that blindsided you that you just didn't expect, you know, something silly, something big that you just hadn't anticipated would be such a, a challenge that you faced? Um, I think the being confronted with the reality of how many different organizations are interfacing to try to solve these problems. So it's different academic partners, different branches of government agencies, um, you know, different private supply companies. There was, for example, a sort of nationwide shortage of plastic pipette tips for robots in the latter part of 2020 that kind of freaked us all out for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, just everyone is, is I think, super committed to trying to solve this, you know, once in a lifetime problem. And it's great in one sense in that, you know, a lot of a lot of the stuff that we might sometimes confront in, in academia of, you know, dealing with different people's personalities and so forth is, is suppressed and pushed on, which is great. But just the sheer scope of the number of interfaces and the fact that most of these people had like never met each other. In fact, I've still, because of the conditions of remote working, never met almost any of the people I'm working with on a day-to-day -day basis in person. Um, it's that much harder to just try to, you know, um, have everybody have a shared understanding of who's doing what and, and having things work as efficiently as possible. Um, and maybe that's not, maybe that isn't a surprise if you, if you kind of stop and think about the complexity of, of what we're trying to do, but it is something that we've had to, um, you know, put some effort into. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, another popular question is um, about um, the new mutation. So now that you have a large amount of people that have started to be vaccinated, are you starting to see any data which would suggest some lineage resistance to the vaccine? Yeah, none yet is the short answer. Um, I think we will see some of that data very soon. Um, so, for example, in the UK, as I as I kind of briefly alluded to before, I don't know, it's, by now it's probably almost ninety percent of new infections are one one seven, and so you know any person who has been vaccinated either in trial or in the rollout of approved vaccines will probably if they sick will have been infected with B117 and so we'll be able to do some comparison soon I think. Um, so yeah I think nothing yet in terms of actual the real experiments of saying look in the population of people who have been vaccinated and, and what, what are the infection rates. Um, as I briefly mentioned there's a little bit of in vitro data that is starting to come out that I think is broadly reassuring. Um, not not all of it is 100% reassuring, but I think broadly speaking, there's no, there's not yet been anything that says, oh my goodness, vaccines are fundamentally not going to work for the next six months. Yeah, another question that is related to the vaccine and and, and to this one as well, is that um, if it was predictable that there would be a large jump uh, to a new fit state of the virus, and what is the probability that this could happen again and risk in this vaccine escape mechanism? Yeah, I mean, so I don't know if it was expected or not. I mean, I'm, you know, my background is, as Matt said at the beginning, is in human genetics. And so I've kind of learned a lot in the last uh, eight months. But, you know, I, you might have, a, a virologist might have made, made some prediction about this. I'm not sure. I will say, I don't think it could be very obvious because there wasn't really anyone talking about this as a, as a likely problem that I was aware of until after we had seen some examples of it. I think the fact that we have seen three very similar lineages arise you know, in the space of a month or two does suggest this will continue to happen. I, I kind of ask myself, is there something different fundamentally? We talked a little bit about this as well as the immune pressure, selection pressure, fundamentally different. And maybe it is, but actually one thing I didn't mention is just globally, the number of cases of COVID just keeps going up and up and up, um, you know, more than linearly. And so I saw someone quote recently that something like, you know, the, the total number of cases in the last two months is as many as the whole prior history of the pandemic. So just there are millions of infections and that gives the virus lots of chances to, to evolve. And so I think we will see more um, probably, you know, I don't say any reason why it won't. And, in, and part of the reason might just be because we have not done a very good job of um, 
you know, containing uh, transmission in the world. And, you know, that's, we just need to be better at that because only by really reducing the number of hosts that the virus is replicating in, do we stop giving it the chance to add new mutations and find ones that are selectively advantageous. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I'm merging a few questions here as well, because there's a few questions about the data that's about the uh, COVID sequences. Where is the data from these uh, viral sequences stored? Can it be used by others for further analysis? And the third part of the question, are there associated metadata? So, so where is it? Can others analyze it? And is, uh, is there associated metadata? Yeah, so the data are um, are stored in a central informatics um, setup called CLIMB, which actually predated COVID, but was was deployed, the version of it was deployed uh, for this project by COG UK, uh, by teams principally in Birmingham and Cardiff. And so all of the COG UK analysis is done on that system. That has the sequence data and a bit of metadata, so mostly um, place date. Then, um, the sequences are all put in a couple of places, sort of essentially totally publicly, one on the COG UK website, which anyone can just go and get the FASTA file. That has the date of the sequences, the sequence, and a um, fairly coarse uh, location. So that's the totally public version. Uh, that also goes into Gizade along with other worldwide data, which is the kind of widely used viral sequence sharing website. Um, if you want more fine grained metadata, like the, the location of each sequence at a local level, you can apply a data access agreement to the COG UK consortium, and I think the details are on the website. Um, finally, there is even more fine-grained metadata really about, um, you know, people's occupations and movements and all this kind of thing. That's only seen by the public health agencies, the four um, public health agencies, because obviously those are extremely personal data, and so those aren't shared um, with the COG UK group or with Sanger researchers. They're just on, used in secure systems by public health agencies who kind of link to the sequences. Thank you very, thank you very much. Great, Jeff. And I'll try and squeeze in just one more quick question. Um, so it's, it's more of a technical question. And I, again, I'll try and combine a few questions, but it, it's about the sequencing technology. And I guess really related to, you know, how are you plexing samples to really increase efficiency? At what scale? How is that done? And and a question regarding you, the utility of long read sequencing, was that considered? Is that a viable option? And, and if not, why? Yeah, so a ton of work went into this um, and some really amazing people in the DNA Pipelines R&D teams at Sanger, so Ian Johnson's teams and Naomi Park in particular did some great work. We currently use 384 Plex on NovaSync after a, it's called the Arctic PCR protocol, where you basically ampl it's amplicon sequencing. So you Amplify, I think it's 90 something um, partially overlapping. Um, there are about 400 base amplicons that tile the, the viral genome, and that then gets uh, put weighed into libraries for sequencing. We have done some examination of both Oxford Nanopore and um, PAC Biotech. We don't have in production, but we're kind of looking into it now because there's some interesting possible advantages. If you look across the COG UK group, of course, a lot of the sequencing is Oxford Nanopore because that's the kind of easy to set up in many places. And then Sanger and a few other places do Illumina. So um, a bit of diversity in there, it helps us get some, um, you know, a bit of variety in the data, though mostly we can get pretty comparable uh, joined up analysis. Thank you. Well, uh, we are at the top of the hour. So I, we, bet we have to end the question and answer session there. I realized we didn't get through all the questions, but I hope we gave it, we, selected a broad range to, to cover most of the queries. So we'd like to thank Jeff once again for his presentation and, and for being so frank and forthcoming in the question and answer session. And also to you, the audience, for joining us at this virtual session. This is our first virtual Sanya seminar for 2021. And we're delighted to confirm that we're going to continue these seminars for at least another six months. So please look out for announcements and our next seminar is on February the 17th. And also um, would like to make you aware that these uh, the seminars and the question and answer sessions 
are stored and made available on the platform. So if you'd like to revisit and rewatch, they are available to and open to anywhere in the world. So thank you once again for joining us and we look forward to welcoming, welcoming you again next month.